All right. So, what are, what does it mean to be endothermic? Yeah. What did we say yesterday? Like right. Because what has to happen is whether you include humans as mammals, which, which you can because the characteristics or traits would be very, very similar between the two. Are we done? Just a simple question. Are we done? Because I don't want to interrupt your conversation. Am I looking at you? Okay. So from yesterday, okay, what's true about the temperature range that, what do you know about that within humans? Is it quite narrow or is it quite wide? Narrow. Okay. So we just say 98 degrees. Of course, you can put a decimal point in there. It's once the temperature begins to drop that around probably 93, maybe 92 degrees, hypothermia would possibly start to set in. Okay. And then possibly by the time it's your core temperature is 85 degrees. I, I really don't think I really don't think that you're going to be uh, alive for much longer because the body just can't take that, okay? I mean, a lot of the chemical reactions you have will just cease because you, you're just not warm enough to do that. So the same thing can happen when you go to the other end of the extreme. Um, having a fever is a natural reaction to uh, bacterial organisms or viral infections because when the body turns up the heat inside, these only have a very narrow temperature range that they can operate. So when you have approximately a, a temperature of 101 to maybe 102 degrees, that can be normal. It's 103 degrees, maybe there's some concern that you might have. And certainly by the time it's 106, that is definitely time to be concerned. And what would possibly happen is you'd probably be placed in a cold water bath because at 106, a lot of the proteins that drive your chemical reactions, which are enzymes, they start to break apart. And when that happens, uh, you, you can't have muscle contractions, okay, for instance. So if your muscles can't contract, does anyone know what two major muscles you have to have contracting all the time? Your heart is one. Well, and lungs aren't muscles. The diaphragm that drives the lungs or causes them to inflate. So those two muscles always have to be contracting it all the time. Although you can suppress your diaphragm, which means you take a deep breath and you can hold your breath. You're just not contracting that anymore. So uh, that, that is one exception to that. But mammals would be no different, okay? So I, I think that is it maybe 106 degrees is normal temperature range for bovine. I think that's pretty accurate somewhere around 106. So uh, once that temperature range maybe gets up to 111, 112, that might be about time to possibly be concerned. And so like we had mentioned, it's the same for mammals as it would be for that for humans as well. Now, one of the things, when it comes to livestock though, I think if you do cool them down with water, I, I think, then you have to keep doing it. At least that's how it was explained to me when, when we had livestock on the farm. You want to be very careful once you start that because once you do, again, the animals, they expect that, okay? And then to uh, drive their uh, body temperature down. Okay. So when we look at this, he can be lost uh, because of a surface area. The example we gave yesterday What's true about the elephants, we said? How can they dissipate heat? Through, through their ears. Because what happens is as blood is carried through their core, it will come to the surface, and that heat can then be dissipated or released. Why? Does that seem interesting to you? Okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. 
Now, one of the other characteristics that we associate that with is hair. So you might be thinking, if you're looking at a dolphin or a killer whale, okay, we know mammals have hair. Where would they possibly have hair? You can't see it on the outside. Well, I'm, that's true, but we've got to be talking about hair. All animals have some, or all mammals have some form of hair, okay? So what do we know about respiration? You have it in your nose, and you have it in your trachea. Does anyone know what those little tiny finger projections are called? I didn't know if that's something you learned in middle school science or elementary science. It's actually called cilia, and when those get agitated, okay? So let's say, for instance, you are having a dried uh, pretzels or chips of some sort, okay? And if a chunk of that breaks off as you are inhaling, it goes into the back of your throat and into your trachea, okay? So, and auto response to that is those cilia get agitated and it causes you to cough. It's happened to everybody, okay? It's not just unique to some people. It happens. Same thing you could say with that of liquids because it's probably happened at the dinner table. You are about to take a swig of your milk or something of water and someone tells you what you think is really, really funny. So you take a big deep breath in at the same time say oh my gosh it went down the wrong tube so then same thing happens it's trying to expel that out of there because you don't want liquids down in your lung or, or in your lungs it doesn't belong there only um, gases like oxygen carbon dioxide belong there but that doesn't answer all mammals have some form of hair so how do dolphins and killer whales or orca breathe. We know that they're mammals, but they live in the water. So do they have lungs? Some sort of hole in the back. Yes, it's actually called a blowhole because what happens? Water moves through that, so it blows out the top. Okay, so blowhole. You put the two together. There's cilia located inside of there. Okay, so that's where they actually have hair and fur as well. So all mammals have hair. It's a major characteristic. They're warm-blooded, they've got hair, and it's all composed of the same type of substance. Now, some hair is more oily than others because some mammals are found, obviously, in the water, like you had mentioned. Otters, river otters, mink, I suppose ferrets could be found in the water. If that is the case, there's probably more grease or oil in their fur. Okay, muskrat. <clears throat> no, on their feathers, yes, not on their hair. So, what might be an example of a mammal that has hair for insulation? Got to think cold. Coyotes. Okay. Arctic foxes, polar bears. Okay. Camouflage. No. I suppose with deer. Okay. Snow hares could be an example. Oddly enough, you watched about this animal last semester. Tigers, because they've got those stripes of orange and black, okay? That actually helps them blend into their surroundings. Now, sensory devices, okay? Viscerae, which is the name of those whiskers that stick out. That can be a sensory device. Cilia inside uh, respiratory tracts as well. Who's got waterproofing? We said that. Muskrats, otters, river otters, any type of mammal that's going to spend time in water that has hair on the outside. They're not going to have that as far as whales and dolphins are concerned, okay? Because their hair is more so located in their respiratory tract, okay? 
This one is really, the signaling is really, really, uh, I don't, not precise. No, I'm looking for an adjective, not precise. Specific, that's what I'm looking for. Okay? Well, yeah, that, that's true. That, that would be signaling, but it could be the color of their hair as well. And I think we briefly mentioned this animal that is part of the weasel family that would have this trait. Skunks. Skunks are members of the weasel families as well. So it's pretty unmistakable that if you're off on a distance, maybe a honey badger and a skunk could be confused. But the behavior that these animals have would be different because do skunks, in this case, they're using this signaling so they don't have to release this precious material. It's their spray, just like animals who produce venom, okay? It's pretty taxing on their body to do that. I mean, yes, if it's a last ditch response or effort to ensure their own survival, yes, they will release that. But before they do that, how would they possibly, uh, yeah, but they're not pointing it at you yet. The tail, yes, but not their hind end. So they might use that for some sort of signaling. Okay, and then this one also is pretty precise. It's one that I'm afraid you're not going to think of. And the reason you don't know this is because you haven't had enough exposure to this. How did you know that? Yes, porcupines, unless you've seen, uh, what is it, Sing 1 and Sing 2? Isn't, the, isn't that uh, a hedgehog or a porcupine that... that Go gets that the name of the lion. Um, I can't think of the name of the lion now. It doesn't matter. But okay. So hair can also be used as a defense as well. Okay. So I want to spend a little more time on that of the honey badgers because you might not think so. I mean, for those of you who who deal with livestock, where there's sheep or pigs or cattle, you can say some of them animals are you think are really, really stupid, but pigs actually have a high amount of intelligence. No, they don't. They, <laughs> they are quite smart. Probably not quite as smart as honey badgers. I don't know if we'll get to that point, but they show studies on how some of these animals figure things out. How many of you have bird feeders? If you have a bird feeder, this mammal is a big nuisance. Squirrels, they're highly intelligent as well. Okay, catch up to you next time. Oh, for those of you that were here, we gave you a handout. It's got a lot of bullets on there, dashes, bullets, or circles, whatever you want to call it. That's got your whatever you want to call that, yes. That has all the orders that you're responsible for, but we got to go through that at a separate time as well. Okay, we'll catch up to you next time.